thanks for coming in, Sean. Uh, we got some some interesting times happening here between Ottawa and Alberta. Eh? Yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah, we've, well, there's been kind of a war of words in the Twitter sphere. I don't know what you call it these days, the exo sphere, uh, between uh, Premier Danielle Smith and Environment Minister Stephen Jubot. Um, pretty much started uh, when he came to Calgary in July, um, followed up with the electricity regulations. And uh, just this week, uh, he traveled all the way to China. And instead of criticizing the Chinese for their emissions, which amount to about a third of all the greenhouse gas emitted in the world, uh, he took a shot at Suncor for uh, selling off its renewables business and said it warrants uh, an emission cap. Yeah, and I mean, the announcement that Suncor, you know, an oil company, was going to remain an oil company came out a, about a week or two weeks ago, perhaps. I mean, when they formally, they've been kind of shedding some of those renewables for a little while, but this isn't really big news. Why Why did Joe Bull choose right now to suddenly go on about a, a Suncor? That's a really good question. I think it is because he's going to come out with uh, the emissions cap. So this is going to be the next shoe to drop. Um Apparently, it was supposed to have been released already, and it's been delayed. So uh, my thought is probably within the next week or so after he gets back from China and before he goes jetting off to Dubai for the uh, COP, uh, I'm not even sure what it is, COP28 summit, um, that uh, these are going to drop, and then he's going to hop on an airplane and get out of town as fast yeah. as he can. Well, the irony of this, this summit happening in Dubai, too, where they don't care. They're pumping the oil out with mad abandon over there and they're more than happy if the canadians are stupid enough to shut in their own resources i i tend to agree i think there's a lot of virtual sig virtue signaling going on with the uh with the sheiks over there because they they want to pump more oil and be seen to be uh good corporate citizens national citizens or whatever while they're doing it yeah, host that summit. There we go. We're, we're good guys. I mean, never mind all that oil we're putting out, which nobody should mind the oil they're putting out. But I mean, isn't it just really demonstrates the futility of Canada always having to play the Boy Scout? And, uh, and meanwhile, he's paying lip service to some of the worst offenders on the planet being China and uh, and some of the uh, Middle Eastern uh, producers. Well, uh, Monsieur Jibou, in his previous uh, press statements, has actually uh, bragged about uh, Canada being the first mover and... Uh, setting an example for all these other countries in the world to, uh, you know, to presumably follow us, even though uh, China, under the Paris Accord, has a 2060 deadline to reach net zero, and India is 2070. And uh, between the two of them, they are half of all the global emissions on, in the world. And we're at 1.6% of the global emissions, I believe. and Something like that. And we're supposed to hit it by 2035. Right. And uh, Suncor is about 2% of that. 1.5 percent yeah so globally speaking even though the world's largest oil sands producer it's we're talking tenths of a percentage point but the ep economic impact i mean if we you know they keep talking we want to transition we want to get out we want to lose the oil and gas and in, in canada I, I mean it provides a, a massive resource for the federal government i mean people seem to forget that some of the supporters in toronto or montreal might not realize but a lot of these social programs they're enjoying are due to this oil and gas uh, being generated out here. Well, they've got a rude awakening coming because uh, I think that the policy of the federal government is actually to make oil production so expensive that it just becomes an uneconomic uh, proposition and producers will basically be forced to leave it in the ground. But what that's going to do for anybody who has home heating oil down east, anybody who drives a car and people are still going to have to drive a car even after the EVs take over, uh, you're going to be looking at, I saw one forecast today, uh, 300 bucks a barrel for oil. Yeah, man. <laughs> if, it, if it costs that much to pull up, but the bottom line is the cost of renewables, if we went to that as a sole source of energy, wouldn't be far behind the oil and gas, especially if you got rid of the oil and gas. I mean, we're all going to take a hard, hard hit here. Well, and it's the only way to really encourage, like when they talk about the transition, the only way to encourage the the transition is not so much to make the renewable energy cheaper, but to make the conventional energy so expensive that the renewable stuff is cheap in comparison. So Premier Smith doesn't sound like she's having any of this, though. I mean, she certainly responded as we would have expected out of out of uh, Daniel Smith. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think she's flabbergasted. 
So uh, she, in uh, discussions, she's referenced uh, her environment with Mr. Rebecca Schultz as the Jubo Whisperer. And uh, I think they're coming to the end of their rope and like re really trying to deal with this guy because uh, every time you take, you seem like you take one step forward, it's like four, five, six steps backwards. And uh, I don't know how long they continue like this. Well, and you can't reason with Gil Bowl. I mean, maybe people will start realizing this. You know, look him up, the picture of him manically grinning in an orange prison jumpsuit as he's being taken away in handcuffs. Like, this man's an extremist. He, he always lines, has yeah. been. We're not talking about a, a you know, a, a environmental activist who's been rational over this time. This is a guy on the fringe, and, and he's the most powerful environment minister in the country. And what's ironic is that he's threatening to uh, have the RCMP come after politicians like Smith and Moe and have them hauled away in handcuffs and orange jumpsuits, you know, for keeping the lights on in the middle of January. Well, and, you know, speaking as a guy who's written a book on pursuing independence in the West, if, if they wanted to send the RCMP to start arresting Western politicians, I know it would be great for my book sales, but not very good for the stability of the country as a whole. I mean, this is really is challenging unity and stability within Canada. I mean, yeah, as Scott Moe, I mean, this isn't Saskatchewan where these battles are happening as well. Uh, it's just dangerous politics going on right now. Absolutely. And, you know, um, there's for all the talk of uh, separation that there's been in this country, uh, Quebec nationalism is more cultural based. Western nationalism is more economic based. It seems to me that these climate policies are becoming the catalyst for the breakup of the country, Trudeau is going to be the one who presides over the end of this federation, this confederation that we know. Well, and some of it's just the politics. I mean, we can see the liberals are in a bad position right now as far as the polls go. I mean, it could be, it, we're looking at potentially two years before the next election. Anyways, a whole lot, we know a whole lot could change between now and then. Uh, you know, nobody in the CPC uh, should be popping champagne corks yet. You're in the lead, but that can, that can evaporate quickly. And one of the tactics, uh, the old one... Uh, used by the Liberals uh, with the senior Trudeau and his advisor, that old term, screw the West, we'll take the rest. Uh, playing the politics of, of regional division has always been uh, an asset for the Liberals, you know, if we, because we, what have they got to lose? they got two seats in Alberta, zero seats in Saskatchewan. If they can make us look like a bunch of jerks, uh, it tends to s sell well in Toronto. Well, even Paul Martin, um, I was really... I thought Paul Martin was a good finance minister, but I was really disappointed when he became prime minister because when he was down in the pools, that's exactly what he did, was start kicking at the West and managed to somehow salvage a minority government out of it. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that the Trudeau liberals are forced so far down that they're not going to be able to come back. But what really concerns me is the damage that they're going to be able to do in two years uh, with this wrecking ball that they have uh, flying around the world uh, imposing all these... Like policy by fiat. Well, an investment chill. I, I mean, really, as an international investor, even a domestic one, when you see uh, that sort of hostility towards an industry in the country, it's going to be a heck of a lot harder to uh, convince you to open your wallet and invest in a capital project when it looks like we've got a, the powers that be want to shut us down. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't realize that about oil and gas is, uh, number one, how much money it takes just to maintain production, never mind increase it. And uh, the lead times, the, the time, the amount of time that it takes, to, you know, to build these oil sands plants, uh, you know, to get this stuff out of the ground and build these markets and build these pipelines and do all these other things that need to be done before you can even sell one barrel of oil. Well, something else, I mean, that really poked the stick in the hornet's nest, and that came from the Alberta side of it. I'm kind of throwing like a curveball. We didn't speak on this, but still, it's been a, it's a part of this issue. Was the 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 moratorium or the freeze on on renewable uh, permits for the next six months in Alberta that the Premier Smith's government imposed? I mean, that certainly infuriated those who feel we're going to fully transition into renewables soon. No matter you know how you look at it, that will slow the development of these renewable projects to a degree. Uh, do, do you? Think that, you know that something's going to be resolved, some better uh, regulations and so on, and, the, and those projects are going to start getting rolling again? Or? Well, right now it's kind of like a wild west, and uh, Texas had this problem uh, when it froze a couple of years. So here in Canada, when you have the natural gas wells and it goes down to 40 below, you have these things called freeze-offs. So mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of production that gets shut in just from the cold. And in Texas, obviously, they're not ready for it and they're not prepared. And when their gas went down and they had to rely on uh, the renewables for their grid, it was just havoc. Like uh, people were getting power bills that were like tens of thousands of dollars. 
Um, you know, and there's a very real possibility that if you don't have that backup for all the renewable generation that people want to come online, that it is going to destabilize the grid. Yeah, so I mean, it's not the renewables themselves that are problems. It's a worry about the dependence on the renewables as a source. Right, and especially when they're intermittent. By definition, they're intermittent. And, you know, I compared this with uh, our other colleague, uh, Nigel Hannaford, uh, you know, so OPEC, Saudi Arabia, they drill wells and then shut them in and just leave them there and drill the capacity, right? Well, it's a lot like these windmills that only run 30% of the time. So you're spending all this money to have an asset that really is only 30% efficient and uh, you can't rely on it when it's not there, when you don't have the other stuff to yeah. And, back it up. and solar is horrific. I mean, we're in the nor northern hemisphere. The, the time of year when we would need it the most uh, as a backup is often cloudy and we only have about eight hours of daylight. So it's a very, very limited generating source for us. Uh, well, I'm kind of surprised that Alberta is actually one of the prime locations in the country for solar. But there again, until you've got some kind of method of actually storing the energy that is produced so that you can uh, turn it on, when the sun isn't shining at night, when it's dark for 16 hours a day, then it probably isn't a very practical proposition to be relying on it as your main source of electricity. Has uh, Suncor responded to this or are they just kind of keeping their head low and, and letting the, the politicians duke it out on this whole thing? I think they're probably letting the politicians duke it out. Uh, they have enough problems with their own shareholders and investors, which I think is one of the reasons why they made that statement to begin with. And uh, they've got nothing to be gained. <laughs> you know, oil companies tend to kind of try to keep a low profile in these political things. But, you know, there again, it goes back to the investment, because if you uh, scare away all, of all this investment, uh, you know, that accomplishes more than what Jibo can ever do on his own. Yeah, and he's more than happy to scare it off. He knows that. I mean, he's not stupid. He's crazy, which is... <laughs> crazy, uh, yeah. Uh, crazy, but not stupid. Which is dangerous. <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're all going to pay a price. Well, what crazy times we're living in. But as I said earlier, I think it's just warming up right now. I mean, Gabo's in China. The Alberta legislature hasn't, uh, you know, hit its new session yet with the premier, you know, newly elected now. She's going to feel a lot more, I think, confident in taking stances now that she's been through an election. Nobody can say she doesn't have a mandate. Uh, and, of course, the parliament's going to go back into session, too. So I think we're just seeing the first, uh, first volleys in this fight right now. Yeah, I think so too. And um, I've been quite impressed with uh, Premier Smith and how she's uh, handled the file. Of, apparently the electricity when she has taken it, it, it is her. And I would imagine that uh, emissions cap will be. Uh, she's kept her cards fairly close to her chest, you know, at the same time while keeping all those options open. The Sovereignty Act, uh, constitutional challenges and you know, uh, but at the same time, being very emphatic and very clear that these are unrealistic, they're unachievable, and they will not be implemented by 2035, and certainly not the way that, uh, you know, the Liberal government thinks that they will. Well, it certainly gives you lots to cover and it gives me lots to rant about. But I appreciate you coming in to explain kind of what's been going on with this fight that's an unfolding. I mean, from China to Alberta at this point. I mean, we've bypassed Ottawa for the time being. Right. And uh, uh, as I said, it's probably only going to get worse. So we should all be keeping a close eye on this. So uh, thanks for coming in to talk to us today, Sean. And, uh, Anytime. Anytime. We'll have thanks. you in again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Corey. Talk later, Sean. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access.